Mario the only person in here. So far. <laughs> uh, none of that is like... right. I was kind of expecting to have everybody <laughs> late. <laughs> Gotta be concerned I'm missing something. Yeah, uh, you haven't missed anything that I know of, anyways. You have any questions while we're here? Uh no, I'm all right. That's cool. Uh I actually, it's funny because I not only did I expect you guys to be here, but I also invited my day class from yesterday to come because they uh, I had to miss. I actually was uh, passing a kidney stone, didn't know what I just got feeling kind of sick and I just felt kind of nauseated all day. And then, like, right after my night class last night, I held online, I passed one. I was like, oh god, that's what's going on. It's only like the second one I've ever passed in my life, so I'm not quite used to that. <laughs> Getting up there in the years. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's what has <laughs> Now, I have heard of people younger getting it, but yeah, it's definitely an old person thing. <laughs> Damn, I had a kidney stone. <laughs> Lost my gallbladder like 14 years ago, so I got all the cool stuff going for me. Like Heisenberg. <laughs> mm. uh, Christian's here. Christian, your name is Christian, right? Or am I, is that just a typo in your name, or am I misreading it all this time? No, it's a typo. I don't know how it happened, and it won't let me fix it. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that awesome? <laughs> yeah, I've got a student that has some kind of funky saying for their name. It's like, you stole my thunder or something. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> you stole my keys or something like that, and that's their permanent Zoom name, evidently. <laughs> Makes it hard to take a roll. <laughs> All right, we got a show in here now. We are on fire. Three minutes in, and we got three students. Well, I guess I should start anyways. I want to go ahead and 
get started. So uh, we're covering chapter 17 now. So we once we finished electricity and magnetism, which was up through essentially chapter 31, that's where we did the uh, uh, we did the pointing vector, which, by the way, hopefully I you know, checked out that Veritasium video I posted on module uh, for either this week or last week. I can't remember which which module I decided to put it in, but it's a YouTube video from Veritasium. Actually, just about everything Veritasium does is good, uh, but uh, and a lot of it's physics, so it's kind of cool. But that one's really nice. It helps you sort of understand what's going on with electricity and how it's not necessarily a little, you know, it's not like water going through a water hose. Electricity isn't, so that kind of helps. You've got some nice ideas and uh some nice demonstrations that they show up so check that out uh but after 31 we go to 17 which is basically uh i think i'm remember, hoping i'm remembering the name right because uh they use two different books and one book they're using the uh is a calculus based version of, of g and coley which is what you guys are using but then my other class teaches the same thing and they're using g and coley but it's an entirely different chapter number but basically we're starting off talking about how uh you can sort of make sense of the world uh by picturing the world is made up of these tiny, tiny, somewhat indivisible solid objects, obviously we call them atoms, uh, and how we can figure out stuff from that alone. So I want to start off with that, which if my if some of my students come from my day class, they've already heard that part, but I'm going to go on from there and get about, uh, let's say, half the chapter done roughly with some very specific examples. So uh, in ancient Greeks, they actually had the first idea that we know of that uh, atoms existed, and their their thoughts were pretty straightforward. They said, uh, if I take a piece of, let's say, hematite, hematite is the uh, mineral that has iron in it, basically, and if you take and cut that, it's sort of like iron, right? Uh, but if you cut a piece in half, and you throw half away, and you cut that half in half, and you throw it half away, and cut that half in half, and throw the other, uh, throw one and a half away, and keep that doing, uh, keep that going on until as far as you can, basically, they realized that there's one of two things that would happen. One, you could do it forever, which they thought was nonsense. And two was they would get to some smallest part that was no longer divisible. And it turns out the Greek word for divisible or splittable or breakable is Tom. And then if you put the prefix, the prefix A on it, that means not. So we got the word atom, which means indivisible. So that's where the idea came from. And then they took evidence of that uh, to be like, for instance, baking of bread. If, if you're you know, walking down the street and a baker's in a shop breaking bread, you can smell the bread. And uh, that, that's actually correct. What's happening is little molecules of the bread are breaking off and they're getting diffused by the air uh, around it. And then that air is wafting out onto the streets and going up your nose. So you're literally getting molecules of bread in your nose. So uh that's sort of it but this idea of it being completely indivisible turns out to not be right you we can break it down there are things that we seem to not be able to break down smaller and smaller uh so far they seem to be the quarks and they seem to be uh the electron uh and basically a few other things but the leptons seem to be them and the quarks so those are the things that are really undiv indivisible. But here's the deal. If you break down a pure element, something made of carbon, or something made of copper, something made of iron, something made of gold, uh, hydrogen, helium, all that sort of stuff, basically you get down to a smallest part. And if you break that apart, uh, that smallest part that still acts like helium or hydrogen or, what, or carbon or iron or whatever you're dealing with, when you break that apart, you get little electrons basically. Or if you really use a lot of energy, then you can get little protons and neutrons or just protons in the case of hydrogen. Uh, but again, they don't act anything like hydrogen or carbon or copper or, or aluminum or gold or any of that kind of stuff. Now, if you have to take a, a compound like water that has you know H2O, that's two hydrogen molecules or two hydrogen atoms combined with one oxygen atom, the smallest part you can divide that into and it still behave like water is the molecule. So the smallest part of compound is molecule. The smallest part of an element is the atom. And above that, things are just mixtures. OK, and you basically can break that down into just about anything until you get a particular part of the mixture. And then that breaks down into individual compounds and elements and stuff like that. So. Uh, that's what we now mean as atoms, these things that are somewhat like billiard balls, 
uh, in that they collide with one another in the sides of a wall, mostly as if they are just infinitely hard balls, meaning they, they conserve momentum and kinetic energy. Uh, if you actually go on that assumption that that's what they are made of, you can actually use that to derive what we now call the ideal gas law. And in fact, uh, it wasn't until 1905 that we really had the first definitive proof that atoms existed, and that was via Einstein on his Brownian motion paper, 1905, the same year. He wrote the photoelectric effect, yeah. which was what he... Uh, uh, which was what he won the Nobel Prize for the same year he wrote Special Theory of Relativity, which he could have won the Nobel Prize for. It was the same year that he wrote as a separate appendix the next day and sent it in, E equals MC squared. Could have won the Nobel Prize for that because that explained exactly why the uh, uh, how the Earth could be as old as it is and how the sun could be as old as it is because at that time, our only idea of how the sun was working was our most advanced fuel system we knew of, which was basically coal. Uh, Lord... Kelvin, also called William Thompson, uh, had basically done a calculation assuming the sun, we knew its mass, but assuming the sun had a uh, certain mass that we knew and assuming it was made of coal, it could burn somewhere between 24, 25 and 50,000 years. And that was consistent with all the records we had, which is pretty much just the Old Testament. So we had the Old Testament and the book of Genesis and, you know, Adam begat such and such at such and such an age and he begat such and such at such and such an age. Uh, you know, Adam was born on uh, like the seventh day or whatever. So you go seven days plus when his son was begat, that's another number of years. And the next one begat next. Keep going until you get up to someone the same uh, uh, or someone that exists at the time of someone, you know, exists, which happens to be Nebuchadnezzar. And that puts the earth at, you know, on the order of 10,000 years old. So long as we're dealing with that, that's fine. Everything's good. 50,000 year old son possibly could live 50,000 years, at least can live 25,000 years, everything's good. But we were getting evidence from geology, from evolution, uh, from a little bit of everything. A lot of different sciences were pointing to maybe the Earth might be 100,000 years old or something amazing like that. So that left a big hole. But in Einstein's finding of E equals MC squared, uh, basically, that gave us a mechanism by which the sun could burn. And a guy by the name of Hans Beth worked out basically what's going on in the core of the sun and it turns out that basically four protons are running into each other basically one proton runs into another turns out that when a proton runs into another at uh, around 10 million kelvin that's the bare minimum temperature it could be one one proton will spontaneously turn into a neutron and then uh it will also give off a positron which is an anti-electron and it will give off a neutrino and then that little guy, that proton neutron, which is actually something called deuterium, it's, it's still hydrogen, but it's heavier than hydrogen because hydrogen usually just has a proton. One of those deuteriums like that will run into another deuterium and then that'll bond and give off some more uh, particles, positrons, and are actually in this case, uh, uh, some gamma ray photons and neutrinos and stuff of that sort. Uh, that will end up being two protons and two neutrons, which is the helium nucleus. And it turns out that the total total mass that went in the total mass that came out is less than the total the total mass that came out is less than the total mass that went in and if you multiply that mass loss by c squared that's the energy per collision okay uh or per construction of a hydrogen of a helium atom anyways so that amount of energy is the amount of energy each time that fusion process occurs and if you say, well, the sun puts out, you know, this many joules of energy every second, then, you know, you can figure out how many collisions will occur or must be occurring every second. And that can allow you to calculate that the Earth turns out to be able to live about 10 billion years old, uh, at least in what we call its, uh, its normal lifespan. In other words, when it's only fusing hydrogen and the helium, as it gets older and older, uh, it'll run out of hydrogen in the core, uh, which is the only place that's hot enough to fuse materials. And then that hydrogen uh, bubble inside will be crushed and the temperature will go up just a little bit. And that'll spontaneously make some more hydrogen uh, uh, fusion going on around the outside shell. But inside now, you'll have nothing but helium in there because burned up basically all the uh, hydrogen and the helium. That helium now will reach a high enough temperature where it can fuse in the carbon and some other stuff. Uh, more massive stars will keep going and going and going and going through all these elements. So that was another big thing that Einstein did. Now, back to the atom process. 
So uh, Richard Feynman once said that if he could only pass on, like, say, one sentence to uh, to the next generation, perhaps, you know, we're facing he's facing a nuclear war, a uh, really bad nuclear war where all humankind is dying. But he could leave one sentence written down on a piece of paper that some other humanoid or uh, animal might be able to read and uh, after the great apocalypse if if he did that he, his sentence would be that all matter is made up of these really small objects that we call atoms uh that jiggle and their jiggle is directly related to how warm or cold they are and some other little details but basically one sentence so that gives you some idea of how important the idea of atoms and molecules is so if you take at the coldest possible I've already hinted to you that temperature is directly related to the average uh, kinetic energy of the molecules and atoms in the substance. So, for instance, my temperature, my body temperature, let's say it's 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, you can convert that to Celsius and you convert that to Kelvin. And what that temperature would mean is that if I could stop time and then go and survey every atom and molecule in my body, this is sort of right, but it gives you the idea. If I could survey every atom and molecule in my body at an instant in time, I'd say, okay, first atom, what's your mass? And tell me the mass. And uh, what's your average velocity, meaning the, the average speed at which your center of mass is moving left, right, in, out, and up, or up and down. Uh, in other words, in three dimensions, straight translational motion. Uh, they give me that average, I take that mass, I multiply uh, that average squared, basically multiply that by one half and put it down in the ledger. Now I do the next atom or not molecule and keep on, keep on, keep on. Now I add up all those atoms and molecules, uh, kinetic energies like I just did, uh, add all those up and divide it by the number that I did. And lo and behold, I will have the average kinetic energy of the linear motion of the atoms and molecules in my body. Turns out that's roughly a, a Boltzmann constant away from the temperature in Kelvin. So if I, you know, divided, essentially divided by the Boltzmann constant, I get a, a pretty close to my actual temperature in Kelvin. So as you can see, the faster the molecules are going or the he more heavy the molecules are that are moving, uh, those both contribute to a higher temperature. So temperature is directly related to the motion. So if you think of a solid, what we know solids, solids as is an object that uh, has a fixed volume and a fixed shape, whereas a liquid has a fixed volume but not a fixed shape, and a gas has neither a fixed volume nor a fixed shape, okay? So a solid has a fixed shape in the sense that if it's a solid state, it comes out, you know, say in a, in a shape of a sphere. Maybe you uh, maybe you milled it down to a sphere. Well, guess what? It's always going to be in that sphere. Uh, if you made it a rectangular solid, it's always going to be in a rectangular solid. Again, unless you take it out of the solid state. But you can imagine maybe making those circles or spheres or rectangles or whatever you, uh, shape you make, you can imagine making them by arranging the atoms in sort of a lattice structure. And the simplest lattice structure you can think of is atom, atom, they're connected by a spring. And it turns out that you know, potential energy wise, uh, if you take any function that you can expand in a Maclaurin series, you know that basically that function is a constant plus uh, constant times the first derivative, but near a near a uh, minima or maxima, the first derivative would be zero. And then the second derivative times a constant times the X value squared is the actual function. So that's just like one half kx squared. So it's like a spring. And that's why we model atom and atom as if they're separated by a spring, but they're moving. So they're doing this. So the simplest lattice is these two here. And then directly below each of those is connected with a spring. So you got two down here as well. They're going to, and these are two you're going to. Now, then you go back a frame and copy those four to have four more identical ones. They're attached to a spring, a spring, a spring, a spring. That's a perfectly rectangular lattice and some some atoms arrange themselves themselves that way some molecules arrange themselves that way uh turns out other ones do different things so you some have that that cube like i said it could be a rectangular as opposed to a perfect cube uh but it could also be a perfect cube and some will have that perfect cube but then it'll have another atom right dead center in the middle of the cube that's body-centered cubic. You, some have, again, that same cube, but this time they also have 
one in the center of this face, 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 and one in the center of that face. That's called face-centered cubic. That's another lattice. And it turns out we, we understand why they do that based on the basically the molecules and atoms they're made of and, and how the bonding works. So that's pretty much how uh, solids behave. And of course, we still have the idea that the higher the temperature, the faster they're moving on average. So guess what? As the temperature gets higher and higher, these things are moving faster and faster. And I think you can see that moving faster and faster means the spring's going to get more engaged. It's going to get closer together. So the spring's going to force out even farther apart. So they're going to reach an equilibrium pre uh, position where the springs are forcing the atoms or molecules to be further apart the higher the temperature is. OK, how far apart? Well, it turns out the atoms on general in general are on the order of a single atom apart from each other, maybe two atoms, maybe three atoms, but roughly on the order of an atom apart. So an atom, an atom, there's an atom here and in, in, uh, in distance, and then there's another atom here. So atom, 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 there's an atom here separating it sort of like that. OK, uh, but as the temperature goes up, it gets larger more than just an atom, maybe it's one and a half atoms, and higher temperature, one, uh, two atoms, and higher temperature, three atoms, so on and so forth. Eventually, you can imagine if I, if I get the temperature high enough, those atoms are going to be so strong that they're not going to be compelled to uh, be gravity, or be, I shouldn't say gravity, <laughs> should not be uh, attracted to one another. Uh, I guess you've probably all guessed that the force of attraction between those atoms to make up a molecule or between those atoms to make up a lattice or between those molecules and atoms to make up a lattice is electrical in nature. Because what's going on is the atoms are neutral, which means they have an equal number of protons and neutrons in it. Uh, but some will hold on to their electrons more strongly than others, and uh, some will not. So you sometimes get one that holds onto its electrons really strong, keeping the electrons right here on this side uh, makes it a net negative, whereas this one right here is not holding onto its electrons so well, so the electrons spend more time on the other side of the atom. So this one looks positive, and they, that's sort of what's attracting them. Eventually, you have to get far enough apart where that, that force is not so compelling. It's not good enough to keep it in there anymore. And what amount of energy has to go into that is the energy that breaks that bond. Whatever that bond is, the amount of energy holding them together by a Coulomb force, that is a characteristic of the material. And in fact, you can keep raising the temperature, raising the temperature, raising the temperature, raising the temperature, and it pretty much just goes out linearly farther apart. So that means we expect the length, say, of a rod is going to be directly proportional to the change in temperature. It's also going to be directly proportional to the length of the rod. The constant of proportionality will be a property of the material, and we're going to show you that in an equation form in a second. But eventually, it's going to stop doing that nice little linear thing and get so far apart that they're going to break. Well, at that point, you have to stop going linear. In fact, the temperature will stop for a little while, and you have to put a big surge of energy, and we call that the... Uh, uh, latent heat of fusion. And if you put that latent heat of fusion into it, then that's going to be enough to break those bonds. And then what's going to happen is the atoms are going to be separated from other from the other atoms they were paired up with, if you will. And now they're free to pair up in, in little bits with other atoms and other molecules within the stuff. But they're sort of rolling on top of each other with a little bit more than a than a uh, atom size between them. So they're just sort of rolling around each top of the other. But this guy and this guy that were always next to each other in solid state, this guy might come over and be over here next to this guy, or it might go back there and be next to that guy over there. And that, that's just fine. So that's the liquid state. And you can see by it moving like that, obviously, it's still because they're still sort of tied to a certain distance apart, you know, two, three, four uh, atoms apart but not to a particular atom. That means that shape can change all it wants to, but its volume can't. So that's why a liquid has a fixed volume, but not a fixed shape. Now, if you go further still, then even that little bit of attraction that just likes them being next to the other atoms is going to be erased because the temperature is going to be so high that they're erratically moving so fast that they don't even, don't even have the ability to bring them to a stop if they happen to come close to one of them. When that happens, they're on the order of, say, 10 molecule or 10 atom distances away. Uh, and 
with that in mind, you can say, oh, well, if they're going to be this far away, then and they're wiggling and free to move because it's like they're acting like they're not even attached to one another, then clearly the shape and the volume can vary. And that's what a, a gas is. But again, you had to break one more bond. So in this case, uh, you'd have to provide a little bit more uh a little bit more temp or more energy, and that energy is called the latent heat of vaporization, uh, or excuse me, the latent heat of that one was actually the last one was boiling, uh, uh, was uh, vaporization. That's the one going down from gas to a liquid, and then from a liquid to a solid. That is the fusion. So yeah, that should work. Okay, uh, but anyways, uh, that's basically what you have to do to make it go to a gas is is add the energy to the system. So if you actually made a plot of uh, temperature versus energy put into a, a particular uh, volume of material, what you'd have is even going down as close as we can get to zero Kelvin, basically the substance is going to have more or less a linear line of constant slope up until it gets to the freezing point. So for water, that'd be zero degrees Celsius. And then it's going to stay at zero degrees Celsius until a heat of fusion is entered. And once that flat line is wide enough to add the heat of fusion, uh, then it's going to switch to going to another linear expression with possibly a different slope. And it does have a different slope for water. Uh, for instance, the, the specific heat of water as, an, as ice is different from the specific heat of water as a liquid. And that's different from the specific heat, if you have one, of a, a water as a gas. So again, we're going to go from zero all the way up to the melting, or excuse me, yeah, to the melting point, and then it's going to go flat until it completely melts. Then it's going to go from that melting point all the way up to the boiling point, and then it's going to go flat until that heat of vaporization exists, uh, has been put in, and then it's going to go, again, somewhat linearly up. Uh, it turns out for very, you know, narrow ranges of temperature, it's basically a very uh, constant rate or slope for those graphs. If you go, say, from uh, let's say three Kelvin up to 272 Kelvin, you're going to find the slope might be a little bit different at the three Kelvin than it is at the 272 Kelvin. So you ideally want to find out what the slope is in the neighborhood of the area that you're working with if you ever wanted to do that calculation, which we'll do in later chapters. Okay, so just thinking about that model of atoms and molecules and matter specifically matter being made of atoms and molecules, we've already figured out some stuff. We figured out that things are going to expand uh, as you heat them up. Liquids, solids, gases, all are going to expand. Uh, we, we, we reached the conclusion that probably the linear expansion, at least, is going to be uh, proportional to the change in temperature. And that turns out to be right for a large range of temperatures. And then you're going to have to add some extra energy to make it change state. And then it's going to have another... Uh, linear expression, taking it from uh, the liquid state to the solid or to the gaseous state, and they have to add some more energy. So we've gotten a lot of stuff already. So for us to really understand this stuff that we got by atoms and molecules, then we need some of the background material that helps us do physics problems. So what is that background material? Well, I'm going to do that now. I'm going to go ahead and share screen. Of hoping it works anyways. It's again telling me to download a plugin. I don't know why I have to do it every a day just about. <laughs> okay, so now that's sharing. So now I go over here. Okay, now I'm sharing. Okay, so it turns out if you want to talk about atoms and molecules, we first need to talk about what's the weight of an atom or molecule. And it turns out there's a really good unit to use for that. So we don't have to make the numbers so big. For instance, you know, the are so small or so cumbersome to write with. So, for instance, we know the proton has a mass of 1.602 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. That whole mass times 10 to the negative 27 is kind of crappy. That's a lot of junk to write. Whereas the mass of the neutron in this system could be like one. That'd be pretty good, right? So the system is the atomic mass unit. which some people occasionally write AMU, which I think is stupid, 
but most people write you. And I think it's stupid just because why well, write three letters when you can write one? <laughs> okay. Uh, I will tell you that this number is roughly, and, and then I'm going to tell you, you don't have to memorize it because you already have a number memorized uh, that'll get you this number. That number is 1.6605. If you really want to go fancy, you can say it's 1.660528, if I remember correctly. Uh, excuse me, 1.660538. 921 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Okay. That really is what uh, this number is to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine uh, decimal places. Now, as I told you, you don't have to necessarily memorize that again if you know of a little number called big N subscripted by an A. Anybody know what I'm talking about that? So big N with a subscript A. Anybody know what that number is? Avogadro's number. So Avogadro's number is uh, 6.022. And that's usually where I stop uh, memorizing, uh, memorizing it, but we actually know quite a few more digits, 141, uh, I think two more, 29 times 10 to the 23, and that's uh, reciprocal moles. So that means really like uh, atoms per mole, molecules per mole, uh, spiders per mole of spiders, anything you want, you can you can put up there, but basically that's why it says per mole. And if you, if you take the inverse of that, if you go one over N sub A, you basically get U in grams. Okay, so if I take that number and flip it over, as I'm going to do now, I'm going to take uh, 6.022, 14129, uh, e to the 23, and I'll raise that to the negative one power, and I'm going to get 1.66, whoa, no, no. oh, phew. okay, yeah, Ooh. <laughs> I typed in, I got dyslexic. I typed in 3, 2 instead of 2, 3. But anyways, this gives you 1.660538. And uh, right there is where it falls off the wheels. It goes 9, 2 here instead of 2, 9. Now I'm wondering if I actually copied the 29 wrong. It was supposed to be 92. But anyways, it's times 10 to the, instead of negative 27, it's times 10 to the negative 24. Okay. So if you, if you actually convert that, this is actually grams. Uh, if you convert that to kilograms, you'll get 10 to the negative 27 because you got to divide it by a thousand. So you do, you don't have to memorize that. Now this U specifically is defined. such that carbon 12 has a mass of 12 U exactly, okay? So it has a mass of exactly 12 U. So that's how it's defined and that's, uh, that probably helps you see why Avogadro's number and reciprocal is essentially the same as uh, U, because uh, remember the mass of carbon is like 12.011 or something like that. But remember, that's the actual average. That's the weighted average of all the different isotopes. And carbon 12 is the isotope that has six protons and six neutrons. So it has 12 particles, all of which are about the same size as a proton. And a proton, like I said, is about 1.007 or 1.006 
1.005, somewhere, somewhere around in there, just like one AU or one U is. So if you think about uh, neutrons and protons being very close to the same weight, then obviously uh, a 12th of carbon 12 would be a hydrogen. And the number of atoms in hydrogen is in one gram of hydrogen is uh, one over Avogadro or is Avogadro's number. So you can just say, well, obviously I'm gonna take one gram and divide it by Avogadro's number. And that'll give me the number of grams per molecule or per atom in that case. So that's, that's why that works that way. So any questions on that? All right, well, we're already in a spot where we can do something cool with that. So let's let's look at a problem. I'm gonna say, uh, given that the density of gold, remember the, the uh, symbol for gold is AU, the density of gold is 19.3 times 10 to the third kilograms per cubic meter. And the atomic mass of gold is 196.9. I'm leaving the units off on purpose. How closely spaced are AU atoms? And B, oops, if gold currently costs $1,717.80 per ounce. I put in parentheses and one ounce equals 28.35 grams. What is the cost per atom? So that's a neat little problem we can solve already, believe it or not. And here's, here's where the learning part comes in. So I'm going to first say solution. What units do you guys, I know I, I learned Avogadro's number and I learned the periodic table in chemistry and I'd never taken physics before. So my idea of the, of the periodic table is that it has a very specific unit for those masses that are written under the elements. What unit do you guys think of when you see, uh, for instance, gold has a atomic mass of 196.97? The molecules in the nucleus. Something about molecules in the nucleus? Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is related to that. What, how do you use it in chemistry? Does anybody remember how they used it in chemistry? It's the grams per mole. There you go. That's, what I, that's the way I always think about it, is grams per mole. And it is right to say that, but here's the weird part. It's also 196.97 U per atom. So that's the other meaning of that. And that helps us out infinitely, okay? So let me show you, for starters, in case you forget, we didn't cover the section on fluid mechanics. Uh, so you hadn't really talked about density, uh, but the density is something that a high school teacher told me they use a heart as a uh, mnemonic to help kids remember density. So if you draw a little heart like that, and then you cross it, you see that the density is the mass over the volume, and that's actually right. So density is mass over volume. So if you think about what is the mass over the volume, well, that's the mass per atom times the number of atoms 
divided by the volume. Does that make sense of every, to everyone? Now that we have that, we can say, okay, well, rho equals the mass per atom times the number of atoms divided by the volume. Now, if we picture the volume as if it is one, two, three, four, n atoms by one, two, three, four, skip a lot, in atoms and then in atoms again then you can see that obviously n is equal to n times n times n is equal to n cubed where n is the number of atoms that make up a distance of let's say one meter. So we'll say this is a one meter cube. So that distance is one meter. This distance is one meter. And this distance is one meter. So now we've got our volume. It's one meter times one meter times one meter. And we know that that volume has a mass of 19.3 times 10 to the third kilograms, right? So if I were to take and calculate uh, what L would be, so I'm going to say this is L, and this is also L, and I'm going to say this is also L, then I could say this is the mass of the uh, gold atom times N, the number of gold atoms, divided by L cubed. And I can also say that rho, rho is the mass of the gold atoms times N cubed over L cubed. Does that make sense to everyone? Let me make this a little cleaner. Because the way I designed this was we're imagining N times N times N atoms where there's basically N in a vertical row one meter long, there's the same number n in a vertical a horizontal row n meters long, and then there's n atoms in a horizontal but into the page uh, this direction uh, in atoms long. So you get n cubed is the number of atoms, and since that cube is L by L by L, you get the volume is L cubed. So if I wanted the, the uh, distance between atoms, what I want is L over N, which I think you can see that's meters per atom, which I think you can see that's the cube root of L cubed over n cubed. So if I solve rho equals m a u n cubed over l cubed for l over n or l cubed over n cubed, I will get l cubed over n cubed is equals the mass of the atom divided by the density. So L over N is going to equal the cube root of 196.97U times 1.6605 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. All that divided by 19.3 kilograms per cubic meter. Notice the kilograms are going to cancel each other out. The kilograms per U, which is the unit on the 10 to the negative 27th number, uh, cancels out the U, and I end up getting a cubic meter in the numerator. 
And then I take the cube root of that. So what I ultimately get is, I gotta go to the next page. So I get L over N is actually equal to 2.57. Hopefully somebody's double checking me on this. 2.57 times 10 to the negative 10th. And that is meters per atom. So what that means is we'll have like an atom here and an atom here and an atom here and the distance to the midpoint to the midpoint is that L is equal to 2.57 times 10 to the negative 10th meters. Again, this is supposed to be in the center. So let me clean that up a little bit. So I'm gonna get rid of that dot, okay. And now I'm going to say it's right about here, okay? And then obviously this little bit from here to here is half of that. And this little bit from here to here is also half of that. So you can see a half plus a half gives you that this distance right here is also L. So that's our answer. Each atom has a space of 2.57 times 10 to the negative 10th meters between it and the next. Uh, the hydrogen atom, for instance, is, uh, I think it's 0. 0.5 times 10 to the negative, so it's one times 10 to the negative 10 is a hydrogen atom. And oddly enough, the hydrogen atom is not a great deal smaller than say the, even the uranium atom. They, they don't, uh, respond that much. So you might get from the smallest atom to the biggest atom, maybe a factor of 13 or something like that, not much bigger than that. Uh, so you can see this is really on the order of the size of an atom. In this case, if we were uh, a, a car, uh, actual gold atom is bigger than a, a hydrogen atom, obviously, but it's not that much bigger. And we see that basically the separation between gold atoms is about two and a half hydrogen atoms. Any questions on that? Okay, so the cost of a gold atom. What we know is that people pay one thousand seven hundred and seventeen dollars and I think eighty cent per ounce of gold, and I know that uh, one ounce is equal is equal to approximately twenty eight point three five grams. Okay, so I can convert this to dollars per gram by multiplying by one ounce over 28.35 grams. So if I do this number, 1717.80 divided by 28.35, I get 60.593. Actually, I can go a little further. Well, I technically can't, but 59, uh, two six so technically i'm i'm held back by these four sig figs so really both of these are extra and that's dollars per gram okay now if i want to know the number of atoms or i want uh let's say dollars per atom then all i have to do is take the sixty dollars and fifty nine two six and divide it by N. Well, what we know is that 60.5926 dollars per one gram. Now, if I take that gram and realize that that's basically uh, one gram can be converted to the number of atoms by this, basically you take the mass uh, and you divide it by the atomic mass. So we'll say uh, divided by 196. Now here's where I'm gonna switch gears. 196.97. 
and that's grams per mole. Okay, remember that's the other unit. So if I divide grams by grams per mole, I basically get just moles on the top. But it's also just grams per atom is another way of looking at it. Or you could say uh, something along those lines. But if you if you do this, if you just divide one gram by 0.77, it'll give you the number of, of moles, basically. So it turns out to be dollars per mole. So if I do this, I get dollar per atom so far is 60.59 divided by, uh, and actually that's division by division. So that's actually the same thing as multiplying by 196.97. And that gives me 11,934. that's an extra sig fig already, 0.9 dollars per mole. But we want to know dollars per atom. So I now have dollars per Avogadro's number of atoms. So if I take this and say uh, Avogadro's number, dollars per mole divide that by Avogadro's number actually multiply that by Avogadro's number yes multiply that by Avogadro's number sorry about that 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms per mole Now I will get the actual answer. So I'm going to divide this by 6.022 e to the 23rd. And that gives me 1.98 dollars times 10 to the negative 20th <laughs> per atom. So if you bought basically uh one followed by 20 zeros atoms it would cost you a dollar 98. any questions on that so that's something that's kind of neat that we can do just by knowing those little facts Another thing, we already figured out that when I did the uh, temperature versus energy added, we reached the conclusion that there'd be some little check marks and then it'd be level right here at the freezing point. I'm gonna write FP because I can't fit the words. That's where it goes from solid to liquid. Obviously, if you're going from liquid to solid, that's where it's actually freezing. Then there's a different slope here, and that's the boiling point. And then there's yet another slope here, okay? That's something we already figured out about uh, how matter behaves just from knowing that atoms exist and their their average random kinetic energy is directly related to the temperature. So from that, we made the conclusion that delta L, the length of a rod, the change in the length of a rod, is proportional to L0 times the change in temperature, and that constant of proportionality is alpha. This can also be written, of course, as L minus L0 equals alpha L0 delta T, or excuse me, delta capital T for temperature, or L is equal to L0 times 1 plus alpha delta T. All of those are equivalent versions, and I can tell you that uh, some of the values, for instance, alpha is called the linear coefficient of expansion. Or the coefficient of linear expansion.
And for instance, alpha for steel or iron is 12 times 10 to the negative six Celsius degrees to the negative one power. Now notice I wrote Celsius degrees instead of degrees Celsius. If you subtract one, one temperature from another, say uh, 150 Celsius minus 50 Celsius, then the answer is 100 Celsius degrees. Whereas if you just told me the temperature is 100 Celsius degrees, you would actually be saying 100 degrees Celsius. That, that's the correct way to say it. So that's that's why it's C and then the, the degree. Knowing that the degree means it's an arbitrary scale. So when we do the <coughs> absolute scale, we shouldn't be using zeros for that. <coughs> uh, another neat thing about this is for concrete, it's also about 12 times 10 to the negative six. Anybody know why that's relevant? Reinforced beams. Exactly. You don't see too much concrete going into roads and bridges and stuff without steel in them. And if steel was in them and they didn't have the same coefficient of uh, linear expansion, then one would move faster than the other at stretching and it would break up the 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 sort of glue adhesion between the concrete and the actual uh rebar or the steel inside so yeah it's a really convenient thing and you know you can imagine other scenarios for instance people get fillings all the time if you use a different material uh a material in your tooth that didn't have the same coefficient of linear expansion as your tooth does then you know if it if it expands much more rapidly, for instance, then you could actually have your tooth explode by drinking a, you know, hot drink or something. That would be, you know, initially not that big a deal, but it'd be a very painful thing after a couple of days if you didn't know what happened. You'd probably have to get a root canal. Uh, another one is for aluminum, that's about 25 times 10 to the negative six reciprocal degrees. So what that tells you is different things actually, uh, expand at different rates. In other words, if you allow the temperature to go from uh, zero to 40 degrees Celsius, that's an increase in temperature of 40, 40 Celsius degrees. Uh, if the object's uh, a kilometer long and another object's made of the same material, but it's only a meter long, then obviously the kilometer long thing is going to increase by a thousand times as much as the one meter long thing because the kilometer is, you know, a thousand times a meter. So you can actually make use of that. In fact, if you take two strips like this, and let's say this one is aluminum, and let's say this one is iron, And we go from, uh, let's say, zero degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius. And I'm going to assume this is 0, 0.0, for instance. Okay. And they're both initially 100.0 meters long, but they're bonded together. You like laid these two sheets together and glued them really well or welded them or something like that, something where they're really not going to separate. What's going to happen is because iron has a coefficient of expansion that's 12 times 10 to the negative six, and, and aluminum has one that's 25 times 10 to the negative six, the aluminum is going to grow almost or more than twice as much as the iron will. So, in fact, what you'd see is delta L for the iron would be equal to 12 times 10 to the negative six reciprocal Kelvin degrees, or excuse me, reciprocal Celsius degrees. And by the way, you can use Kelvin minus Kelvin or Celsius minus Celsius. Uh, it doesn't bother it either way because the size of Kelvin and Celsius are the same. The initial length is 100.0 meters. So that's alpha times L. Remember the expression we're using is delta L is equal to alpha L delta T. And then this is going to be 40.0 degrees Celsius minus 0, 0.0 degrees Celsius. When I do that math, I get 12e to the negative six times 100 times 40 Celsius degrees. And that gives me 
0.048. Notice whatever units I put in is what comes out. So that 048 meters are about 4.8 centimeters. Now let's see what happens to the aluminum. The aluminum is 25 times 10 to the negative six Celsius degrees reciprocal times 100.0 meters times 40.0 degrees Celsius minus 0, 0.0 degrees Celsius. This one's gonna give me Zero point one zero meters, which equals ten point zero centimeters, roughly. So uh, the aluminum is actually going to bend quite a bit, and in fact, what you see is going to make sort of sort of an arc of a circle, and it's going to look like this, where the uh, aluminum is on the outside. and the irons on the inside. And if you assume it's part of a circle, then this angle of theta could actually be calculated if you wanted to. But the main thing you gotta know is this side is 100.048 arc length. And this side is 100, ooh, not 0.48, sorry. And this side is going to be uh, 110. I, th I think it was 0 0.048. Yeah, that's right. It was 100 meters, wasn't it? Thanks. Nice catch. I was literally like, oh, you're screwing up. And yeah, you're right. Because, yeah, this would be centimeters in the ones place there. So it'd be 0 0.048 meters. And this would be 100.10 meters. Okay, so we already have a neat application for this, and it's all, always used. Anybody know where they've seen something like this be used before? Thermostats. Yeah, thermostats. Us old people that either had to live in apartments on our own or, or uh, own a house or have owned a house or something, we know that if you open up your thermostat, uh, you're going to see basically a needle that points to the temperature. And you're going to see a little piece of metal that coils around and around and around and around and around and around and around. Because obviously, uh, this stuff doesn't do that well. You don't get much of a change for a given change in temperature unless the thing is really long. So making a biometallic strip spoil up like that, spooled up like that, uh, as the temperature increases, this thing is going to cause uh, the length of the cord to get longer and that's going to cause this needle to deflect this way. And it'll go the other way, of course, if it gets cooler. Now they'll actually make this do triple duty, which is really cool by actually say putting a little uh it almost looks like a tylenol capsule but it's a little glass tube and it'll have two wires in this end and two wires in this end and what you'll have is in fact a little pool of mercury in there now why would they use mercury one is it's liquid so it holds its volume, but not its shape. So it can readily go from leaning against the bottom to leaning against the left edge to leaning against the right edge. And two, what is special about mercury as a liquid? Can you think of anything? It's a conductor. Yeah, it's a conductor. So in fact, uh, using mercury allows it to conduct electricity. When you think about it that way, then you can say, well, wait a second, this is mercury. Sorry, I'm trying to write that a little neater so everybody can see. When you think about it that way, 
uh, once this thing is tilted to a certain amount, say it's tilted uh, to the left, then the mercury pulls over in the left-hand side and completes the circuit that those two wires are coming from. This will say uh, it's gotten hotter, say, or actually if, if it went that way, yeah, it would say it's gotten hotter. So it would say turn AC on. And you would adjust a dial that actually moves where that uh, mercury is and they just calibrate it according to that. So you can allow that, for instance, to move. And if it moves to the left, that means it's gotten hotter. And if it moves enough for the mercury to connect the two wires, then the AC will automatically come on. As it gets cooler and cooler, though, then this thing will move to the other side and you'll get the mercury pulling up and completing the circuit for the other side. And that other side will say, turn the heat on. So in this case, it's actually doing triple duty. Uh, you've got a mercury uh, or you've got a bimetallic strip that you can calibrate to read temperature uh, by wherever that needle points. You just you know do some critical temperatures like 60, 65, 70, 75, 80, 85. That's probably enough. And you mark those spaces and uh, where they are whenever that thing reaches that temperature. And then by putting that little bottle on there, it, it can also act as a uh, switch to turn on the AC when it gets too hot and turn on the, the uh, heat when it gets too cold. So yeah, that's that's one of the major uses of, of bimetallic strips. That worked even less good than I thought it would. So any questions on that? I just got bored with that being two different, uh, being the same color. All right, so that's that's an example of uh, of linear coefficient. It turns out there's also a uh, coefficient of expansion for an area. Uh, maybe we use sigma or something like that. And it turns out that delta A would be proportional to. Well, actually, let's let's go ahead and go to the equal symbol. So delta A is equal to, let's say, sigma times A0 delta T. That's where if you had a plate, the surface area A would change to an amount A plus delta A. OK, if the temperature changed. Well, it would turn out that sigma is about equal to 2 alpha. And then there also happens to be a delta V is equal to beta V0 delta T. And that turns out that beta is essentially equal to three alpha. So however many dimensions you got, you multiply alpha by it. And for that given material, and you'll still get the right answer. OK, so your book does a problem where basically you, you imagine you have a, a think they said a 17 liter, might have been a seven liter. I can't remember. But let's, you know, just for argument sake, let's say we have an 11 uh, liter, or excuse me, a 17 liter gas tank. It's bone dry. You fill it up to the rim, which you're not supposed to do, by the way. You fill it up to the rim uh, early in the morning, and that means you've got a full 17 liters of gasoline in it. Then you let it go from, let's say in the morning it was 20 degrees Celsius. No, let's say in the morning it was five degrees Celsius, and you go from five degrees Celsius to say 20 degrees Celsius, which is pretty hot. Uh, what you'll see is both the the volume of the gas tank is going to expand and the volume of the gasoline, which you can look up in the table in your book, has a coefficient of uh, volume uh, expansion, that beta value, that's bigger than for steel. So if you take the amount of uh, volume changed by the uh, gasoline minus the volume changed by the tank, that's how much it'll actually overflow. So that's another problem you can work, but I've sort of given you the strings and guts for it. So you really don't have to, uh, I mean, I just want you to go make sure you solve it and understand it or whatever. Uh, another neat thing is you might wonder, so let me stop the screen for a second here, stop screen sharing for a second. You might wonder, uh, let's say, let's say we had this and it had a hole in it and it, let's pretend it's made out of brass, okay? So it's made out of brass, it's got a hole in the middle, 
and the hole is exactly the same size as uh, another little round brass disc we got uh, uh, from the center. Okay, so the question is, if I heat this brass up, according to these equations I've just given you, every dimension increases. So if I heat this, gra this brass up, does that mean it increases towards the center so the hole gets smaller? Or does that mean it just increases on the outside so the hole gets bigger? Anybody want to take a guess at that? If you've read, you already know the answer, but does the, the hole, hole get bigger, bigger or smaller when you increase the temperature? Gets bigger. Gets bigger, yes. If you had a life experience, you know it. Uh, and the, the way you can wrap your head around that is you ask, what would the brass that was cut out of the center, what would that do if it were there? Obviously, that would actually increase in size, so the hole is going to increase in size. So that's a, a fundamental physics concept that, of course, we all should know. All right, so now that we've sort of handled those issues, something else I wanted to do uh, was get you thinking about temperatures. So anytime you have a, a physical property that changes with temperature, you have a potential thermometer. So for instance, we learned early, like in chapter 22 or 23, maybe, I think it was 23, might've been 24. We learned that resistance is directly related to temperature. In other words, the higher the temperature, the higher the resistance. So you could actually take a piece of wire or something really precisely known what its temperature dependence is and mount that somewhere where you need to keep track of temperature. And that could be a temperature sensor. Basically, you'd have a little power source that would send a current through it. And another thing would monitor how much current how much current is going through it. And if the uh, resistance got larger, the current would actually decrease. And you'd maybe set a logic chip to say, hey, if it gets above this temperature, uh, cut the power to everything. So that's, for instance, a thermistor, which is uh, some of the thermal protection you have in your dryers. Uh, dryers are potentially really dangerous. Uh, that's why I tell you, make sure you change your lint basket every time you do laundry and stuff like that. But uh, when dryers go out, they often grow out in such a way that they get super, super hot. And if they get super, super hot, or even if they don't get super, super hot, if they get that clog built up of the, the lint over several washings, just the regular temperature can get enough against metal to make that stuff set ablaze and, and get on catch on fire. But when your dryer goes out, sometimes it just errantly gets way too much current through a smaller part of the element because the element broke. And then that'll actually make for a lot higher temperatures. It'll start off like your your clothes will have a little smell like they've been scorched a little bit. And eventually they'll even get to the point where your, your clothes will actually get scorched. Uh, but they're supposed to have a mechanism. Once that starts happening, it just stops running. So the more modern ones will have a thermistor or some kind of thermocouple device that will either cut current to the heat or cut current to everything and put up an error message. So you could use that uh, resistance as a function of temperature as a device for measuring temperature. You can also use, since I showed you uh, delta V is equal to beta V delta T, you could use volume as a measure. Uh, does anybody know of anything that uses volume as a measure of temperature? This is one of those questions that's uh, after the fact, you're gonna smack yourself. <laughs> Any thermometer. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it was funny. One of my, one of my smartest kids in my class uh, was like, man, I can't think of it. And, and the girl that usually doesn't, uh, actually, I think it was a boy that usually doesn't answer any questions. He answered it. And my, my really, really bright guy that's like way ahead of everybody, he's like, he's like, ah, God, I can't even remember that. So yeah, uh, a thermometer basically has a bulb that holds a buttload of liquid in it. Okay. And then it has a very thin little tube with essentially a vacuum above it so that it can easily move up and down uh, without back pressure of whatever air or something to be above it. It's essentially a vacuum. So uh, as the temperature rises, that liquid that you have in there, which used to be mercury on just about all of them, and then it was toluene on just about all of them, but then we found toluene causes cancer as well. So we got rid of that. Now we're using mostly colored alcohol, but either way, as that temperature goes up, the volume increases and that causes the volume to be not only the bubble volume, but plus that little cylindrical length in here. So if you take a device of glass, uh, a thing of glass and make a little thin tube down the center, close it off and put a bulb at the end and then put enough liquid to where it reaches 
uh, even at say negative 10 degrees Celsius, the, the liquid comes up above, you know, the bulb. If you do that, then you've got the beginnings of a, of a thermometer. You've got a thermoscope, uh, definitely. So you could take and stick that thing in the tri in water at triple point because of the triple point of water only occurs at exactly one pressure and temperature. And that's 273.14 Kelvin, or excuse me, 0.16 Kelvin. Uh, so if you put it that and let that thermo thermometer reach equilibrium in that uh, triple point of water where water exists as solid, liquid, and gas all at the same time, uh, wait for that level to level off. Then you can put a little etch mark in the glass and you're going to call that 0.1 degrees Celsius, for instance. And if you just put it at a boiling point of water, you could call that zero degrees Celsius. Okay. And then you put in a, a boiling vat of water and let it reach equilibrium. And then you mark where the top of the liquid is there and you call that 100 degrees Celsius. And then you say, okay, well, in the Celsius scale between boiling point and freezing point of water, we have 100 degrees. So we're going to measure that, divide it by 100, and put a mark at each one of those distances. Okay. So then you went from a thermoscope to a thermometer once you had it marked with, uh, with actual temperature values. So that's actually how a thermometer works. That's pretty helpful. That's another thing you can use. Uh, you could use that by metallic strip. Uh, again, like I just showed you. So those are different ways you can use it. But it turns out something kind of cool occurs. Uh, if we were to meet an alien species, I'm talking an alien species that probably was on a planet that might be so advanced that they just live on spaceships now and go from place to place or whatever, or they might be so uh, advanced that they go from place to place specifically because their planet was somewhat destroyed and they're looking for a better place where they don't have to kill things, uh, but they can still have a planet. So they might be riding around like that. They could literally come from a, a star system other than our own. That would be the more likely culprit. I don't think we're going to find much more than, uh, you know, bacterium or something like that in any planets in our solar system other than Earth. Uh, but other star systems might have it or it might even have to go outside of our galaxy. Uh, but then that's sort of prohibitive, prohibitive of us to find it unless things like wormholes exist or there's some laws of physics that we don't know yet that allow us to travel faster than light because you know the nearest galaxy to us major galaxies 2.5 million light years away and even if you're you know going at 99 percent of the speed of light you're still going to age on the order of 2.5 million years to get there so uh obviously a human can't make that long so anyways if we found an alien species one thing you can be certain about is they will have an equivalent to the Kelvin temperature system, okay? And this is why, and this is also why it doesn't have a degree on it. So if I make a plot of volume versus temperature, let's say this is the volume in cubic meters, and I plot that versus temperature in Celsius degrees, I keep writing a time instead of. I think you're supposed to be sharing your screen. Yes, I am. Thank you. I was just sitting there thinking, hey, did I share this yet? I am smart. I look for things, things that make us go. <laughs> Here we are. That's it. Cool. So, Star Trek plot. reference. Was that now? Oh, that's a Star Trek reference. There's these dumb, uh, super powerful aliens that went around. They kidnapped Jordy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We are smart. We look for things, things that make us go. <laughs> All right. So neat thing happens. If you take water vapor and you make a plot of temperature versus volume, the plot will look something like this. And that G means gaseous state. Okay. However, if you take, uh, let's say, sodium hydroxide liquid, and make a plot of it. It's as a gas, its volume and temperature graph looks like that. In fact, every element and every compound we know of all point to the same spot. And that spot happens to be negative 273.15 degrees Celsius. It also happens to be 
negative 459.67 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which I'll address that as well. So in that sense, that every, every, every element, every compound, everything we know of, when we make a plot of, vo of volume versus temperature, they all converge back on this one spot as if all of their volumes go to zero at that one particular temperature. Uh, that means that one particular temperature is something big. Now, we as humans, and from what we know about biology as humans, think that life is super important. We know it's super important to humans and, and animalia and plants uh, and fishes and, and insects, but there might be some kind of life that doesn't need water. Uh, so water's not necessarily going to be a temperature-based system that we'll find. It probably will be, but not necessarily. Uh, and not only that, they might live in an atmosphere that's entirely different than ours. So their atmospheric pressure might be a lot higher, uh, which makes the boiling point a lot higher uh, temperature, stuff like that, or it might be a lot lower when the boiling point be a lot lower. But either way, what we have is a, a system where we can say, uh, let's base our system on boiling point. on freezing okay so one of these systems we'll call degrees celsius and one of these systems we'll call degrees fahrenheit and in the celsius we're going to say this occurs at zero and this occurs at 100 in the Fahrenheit, we're going to say this occurs at 212, and this occurs at 32. So the difference from here to here is 100 Celsius degrees, and the difference from here to here is 180 Fahrenheit degrees. Okay? So this spot corresponds to this spot. And then, of course, if we go all the way back down here, this is absolute zero. So this will be negative 273.15, and this will be uh, negative 459.67. Okay. It turns out there exists another system called Kelvin and called Rankin. And the Kelvin goes to uh, 273.15 here, and it goes to 373.15 here, and it goes to zero here. Rankin is ugly, and I hate it, but it's going to go from zero here, which is the easy part. Now I've got to add 32 to 459. That's 489, 491.67. So this is 491.67. And then more stupid, I got to add 180 to that. That'd be 5670, 671.67. And I'm doing this math in my head, so you might want to check it later. But that's our, our system. So it's Rankin. Fahrenheit, you know, and Kelvin. And notice only the Celsius and Fahrenheit has a degree symbol on it. Again, that's because they took an arbitrary scale. They said, we're going to say the difference between uh, freezing and boiling of water is 100, which I think was really good. Uh, Fahrenheit, they said, we're going to make it 180 and we're going to call the bottom 32. And I just think that's the stupidest thing ever, but they did it. Okay. Now there's formulas you can use to derive a uh, uh, are to change Celsius to Fahrenheit and Fahrenheit to Celsius. And that's what a lot of classes teach. We don't, we don't teach that anymore. We discovered that's not very good. Uh, we want you, one, to not think about uh, translating or, or converting units when you talk about Celsius. We'd prefer you to just have an understanding of Celsius in its own right. So there's a little poem we can use for that. And it is uh, 30 is hot. So is hot, I think it's 30, yeah. 20 is nice, 10 
is cold and zero is ice. So that's a poem that you can use to do it. But really what we try to do is we try to not make you think in terms of formulas. Now you can totally do it. You can totally do something like, okay, I think uh, Fahrenheit is equal to M times Celsius plus B, where I'm using the model of Y equals MX plus B, right? And then you can plug in uh, zero degrees Celsius times M plus B corresponds to a Fahrenheit of 32. And that tells you, oh, B is equal to 32, right? And then you can say, okay, well, now I've got F equals MC plus 32. And you can say, okay, well, I know that 212 corresponds to M times 100 plus 32. Uh, that gives you that, uh, dang it, turn into an eraser again. That gives you 180 is equal to M times 100. So in fact, M is equal to 180 over 100, which you can also write as 18 over 10, which you can also write as nine over five, which you can also write as 1.8 over one. Uh, all of those are valid, okay? I just derived the formula that uh, relates Fahrenheit or Celsius to Fahrenheit, and that is Fahrenheit is equal to nine fifths Celsius plus 32. I did that, but and, and I can't tell whether you used it, but I'll tell you that they prefer you not to use it because you understand it better if you do it this this other way that I'm getting ready to show you. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, whoa, scare me. I just went the wrong thing. We're going to say, let's convert that 50, or excuse me, let's convert that 30 degrees Celsius. Did I do 30? Yeah, I did 30. So 30 degrees Celsius. I want that converted to Fahrenheit. Well, what I'm going to do is I'll say, okay, 30 degrees Celsius is 30 Celsius degrees above water freezing. Okay, now I'm going to use that slope and I'm going to say, okay, 30 Celsius degrees times, I know that Celsius is going to change by, let's say, 10 Celsius degrees for every 18. And when I say, let's say, that's mean I'm, I'm actively choosing which version of the slope I want to use. So a change of 30 Celsius degrees is equivalent to three times 18 which would be 30, 40, or excuse me, 54. That's right, 30 times 10 is three, three times eight is 24. So 30 plus 24 is 54 Fahrenheit degrees above freezing. So what's freezing in the Fahrenheit scale? And there's our answer. Okay. So yeah, I'd agree. 86 is kind of hot, right? So 30 is hot. They're right about that. What about, uh, let's say we take the Fahrenheit scale. Uh, and let's say uh, Fahrenheit is going to be... Yeah, Fahrenheit is going to be, let's say, uh, 68. Okay, so that's our question. Just like that was our question there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say 68 degrees... Fahrenheit is equal to, I'm going to do 68 minus 32, 8 minus 2 is 6, 6 minus 3 is 3, equals 36 Fahrenheit degrees above freezing. 
Now, if I was closer to 212, I would use 212. Or in the Celsius case, if I was closer to 100, I'd use 100. Uh, if I was closer to absolute zero, negative 273, I'd, I'd use that too. That's that's fine. It doesn't matter. You're always going to the same thing. Uh, but you just want to go to the same thing on both parts. So I know 36 degrees Fahrenheit is how far Fahrenheit degrees is how far away I am from freezing. So I'm going to write 36 Fahrenheit degrees and I'm going to use my fraction again. And this time I got to make sure the uh, things that were on the numerator will have to go in the bottom. This one tells me I should probably use the nine and the five. And this is Celsius degrees over Fahrenheit degrees. So you can see 36 divided by nine is obviously four. Four times five is 20. Whoa. So I get 20 Celsius degrees above freezing. So if I add 20 plus zero, I get 20. So uh, 68 degrees Fahrenheit corresponds to 20 degrees Celsius. So that's how they want you uh, to calculate this stuff. Does that make any sense to you guys? Yes. Okay, so that, that's sort of the new, new paradigm. I like it. it. It allows me to quickly convert. I am getting better at knowing my stuff, but as you can tell, I'm not still not that good because I can never remember if that poem starts with the 20 or 30. But notice we just figured out that the 20, which we said is nice. I mean, that's like friggin' fat man Shangri-La right there. 68 feels great uh, to me. So yeah, that's a, that's, that's a good temperature. And then of course, 10, you'll notice another way you can think about it is every time you go down or up 10, in Celsius, that corresponds to an 18 change in Fahrenheit. So if I went from 20 down to 10, that means I'd subtract 10. That also means that I'd subtract 18 from the Fahrenheit. So 10 degrees Celsius is in fact 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Oop, left off the zero degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a, another one you can do sort of quick and dirty. Oh, now it won't make me an eraser. Isn't that nice? So uh, I know immediately that that is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, I actually used that method. I just didn't have to do all the formal work. And in fact, I probably wouldn't even take the time to write all this stuff when I'm doing it. I just think it out in my head. You guys can write it, especially while you're trying to learn how to do it this way. Uh, and you can write it like on your test to keep you from making careless mistakes. But really, you're just going to compare how far you are away from some set temperature, whether it be the freezing point of water, the boiling point of water, absolute zero, any of those doesn't matter. Uh, but whatever you do, you find out the distance in that scale from that particular point, and then you convert that distance, which is now uh, a unit divided by degrees using those fractions. And then you remember, is that above or below such and such a point? And if it's above, then you add that to the, uh, point that you had, or if it's below, you subtract the point that you had that you compared it to from it. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, All right. I'm pretty sure the Fahrenheit scale wasn't based off of water. It was based off of human feel. You think so? I, I wondered. Uh, well, yeah, 100 I mean, feels very hot and zero feels very cold. Yeah, I imagine zero is, is brutal. But why did they use the perfect, you know, 32? It's not 32 point you know, eight, nine or 32.46. It's obviously been retrofitted. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I, I don't know. I need to read the history I mean, the of that. Original the original Celsius scale. The yeah. original Celsius scale started at 100 degrees was the freezing point of water. Zero degrees was the boiling point of water. And then <laughs> I think it was That's actually cool. 80 degrees was the freezing point of water. And then the French took hold of it. And then they, during their revolution, when they changed everything to decimal and they flipped it, and uh, change it to 100. Oh, uh, cool. This is from your, your cooking days in the Navy, isn't it? No, they didn't teach us anything about, uh, about, <laughs> about Celsius. <issues. laughs> Where did you read about that? I never heard that story. I, I knew the centigrade system I can't changed remember. I picked a lot. it up somewhere. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'll check it out. That's neat. Thank you it for was, sharing that. If, All right. I think All it was a left, YouTube uh, video I saw in the history of Fahrenheit. Oh, okay. I'll, check, I'll look it out that way. Uh, 
we've basically gotten through what I wanted to do. What I mentioned to you is there's something called Charles or something called Boyle's law. And that's the scuba divers law. I'll quickly write these down. You're free to go if you want. Uh, it's actually, uh, actually you're two minutes late now, uh, but Boyle's law is one of the quote unquote. Oh, 15 minutes late. oh. 520 to six, I thought it was 520 to 650, right? 640. Oh, maybe my clock's wrong. That's it. Okay. Oh, oh, oh okay. Never mind. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. So, so yeah, we went over. Uh, anyways, uh, all I was going to do was introduce Bull's Law, Charles's Law, and the Gay Lose Act Law, but I'm okay with not doing that. So uh, if anybody has any questions, stick around. I'm sorry for keeping you late, but I'm glad that I kept you on the positive side instead of the negative side like I always do. Luckily, I didn't have that tonight, though, right? Very good night. Yeah, that's cool. All right. Well, I'll wait for the last person to leave. Other than that, you guys are free to go. Thanks for coming. Robert, did you have anything?